Hi, I'm Jenny Brocky. Tonight on Insight, burnout and how to beat it. Work got the best of me and my family got what was left. Shani Layton became a netballer and I lost to Shani really was because of that. Zero to cranky was something that was happening much more often. I was actually told I needed to take three months off and I was like, no, I can't do that. The onus is on the individual, but it's also on workplaces to really start thinking about how to curb burnout. My biggest fear is that the day will come when the alarm will go off and my mind will be saying, not today, girlfriend. When I first started on the farm, I found it quite exciting. It was a novelty, it was something I was not used to. Yeah, you know, I was out in the open, in the fresh air, and producing a product that the country relies on and, and all the rest of it. Now the morning when I wake up and the alarm's gone off, uh, the day starts with quite a few profanities. Our working week on the farm involves seven full days. We have no staff or anything like that, and we're not in the position where we have annual leave, sick days. We don't even get weekends. Steve and I had two days off roughly four months ago. Prior to those two days that we had off, we'd worked in excess of 420 odd days. Every day is a Monday. It's Groundhog Day. You get into this cycle of repeat and replay and and you go into autopilot it's a struggle just to i think sometimes even think straight with what you are doing because it's just all so monotonous you tend to dwell on things you can actually go in there in not not too bad a mood and by the time you're finished uh, i can i can be raging you start to question why you're working yourself the way you are you know you're slogging it every day and putting in so much of yourself and it seems to be for everyone else's gain. You keep throwing this around, boy, you're gonna lose it. In a lot of ways, you're not in control. Steve and my whole relationship has been dictated by the farm. It's centered around the farm. It's the farm that controls us. Cheryl, you said that you and Stephen work seven days a week on the farm. What sort of hours do you work? Uh, I personally do 80 hours thereabouts a week. Uh, that's boots on, so that's actual farm work. Um, Stephen? Uh, anywhere from 100 to 120. Why is it just the two of you working on the farm? Can you get help? Yes and no. It's actually a little difficult to find staff. And we just found that this, you know, we were 60 odd thousand dollars a year for a staff member. So you couldn't afford it? Well, that money was better spent elsewhere on the farm. Why can't you take time off on a dairy farm? Just for people who might not understand. You're in charge of a lot of animals. Um, so you can't just walk off on a hot day. Um, you might come back and have a lot of uh, animals dead. Like, if any, things go wrong on farms. Um, water pumps break down. And but they have to be milked? The they cows have to, have to milk be milked? Twice a day. Yeah. Twice a day. Twice a day. Well, Cheryl, you've been working on the farm for four years. Before that, you had an office job. You said there it was exciting at first. What's it like now? Not as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think if it wasn't the day in, day out, routine that it is. On any given day of the week, I could not tell you what day of the week it actually is. Because it's just it's, the same that's every right, day. That's right, and it's totally irrelevant. Uh, it, it makes no difference to us what day it is. It's, it's Monday every day. Stephen, you've been doing it for 30 years. Um, what's it like for you now? I mean, after 30 years, you get used to the physical side of things. Um, you, you still get tired, and I guess the way I gauge how tired I am, you, Let's go to Christmas Day, the most important day of, of the year for, for yourself and, and your children and families. You've got to get up, you've got to milk a couple of hours early so you can be there for Santa to turn up to the kids. You've got to run off and have lunch somewhere and you've got to turn around and get in the car and go home early to milk the cows. So it's relentless. It is. It, it is, and it is, and it's not, it's not an entirely thankless job. I mean, um, 
Oh, look, I'm a sixth generation farmer, so to me, I've got an attachment to the land, I've got an attachment to, to the animals. Um, so to me, that is some reward for what you do. Um, but certainly, taking home um, more than $2.50 an hour would be, would be nice. Um, I mean, if I, obviously, if I wanted to be a millionaire, I would have picked something else other than dairy. Um, so money's not everything, but at the same time, um, you know, 100 hours a week, we're, we're taking home less than your average doll bludger. Cheryl, Stephen's been doing it for 30 years. You've only been doing it for four years. When did you start feeling burnt out? And I don't think it was something that one day I went, oh, gee, I'm tired. It, it, was, it was probably 18 months ago. It's, it's been a, a progression, but it's more... You just start to notice that each day is more of a struggle. My biggest fear is that the day will come when the alarm will go off and my mind and or body will be saying, not today, girlfriend. Um, and I don't know what I'll do if, if that day does come. Mm. Do you feel like that day is coming where you just literally won't be able to get out of bed? No, I, I think it's still a, while, a, a little while off. I'm actually quite surprised at how far I can push myself. What about you, Stephen? How are you feeling? And Cheryl feel, feels burnt out. What about you? Um... Well, I've been on autopilot for a long time now. I probably react more to watching Cheryl um, having a hard time. Um, you feel guilty that, you know, it's my fault that I've, I've, I've got Cheryl in this position. You know, maybe if I was a better farmer, maybe this wouldn't be happening. Maybe if I'd have done something else, you know, I wouldn't have to put my wife through this. As I said, I'm sort of fairly accustomed to it now. Um, mind you, I'd fall asleep in a heartbeat anywhere, any time. Right now? I had a 40-minute dentist appointment the other day and I woke myself up three times snoring in the dentist chair. Um, uh, no, thankfully, they're understanding and they know I'm a farmer, so they just give me a funny little smile when I walk out and pay the bill. But, I mean, who falls asleep in a dentist chair? Not many people, I don't think. No, no. Anne-Marie, you're 45. You started working in the law 22 years ago. What was it like for you initially, working in the law? Oh, it was fantastic. I loved every bit of it. It was um, exciting, it was important, it was a bit glamorous and hugely rewarding. Mm. What did you want at that stage? What did you want to be? I think I wanted to be everything I was ever going to be by about Thursday and uh, if that was the benchmark I was determined to get there quickly and lots of external measures of success. How were other people faring and what was the trajectory that a young lawyer could be on? You worked as a legal associate in family law first and then you started working in a commercial law firm in your 20s. How did you approach that? I think that was the culmination of a life lived on adrenaline. It, it was really a fantastic environment. What sort of hours were you working? Oh, easily 12-hour days in the office. Um, and when I was... Um, younger could just stay there until the work was done and that would be as long as it took. You started your own firm when you were 30, why? Uh, I realised that for me big law wasn't really sustainable, the pace was uh, really unrelenting and I wanted something different from my life as I you know, got to my 30s and started to think about a family and how I would make all of that work. I didn't have a lot of role models in terms of how you could achieve that work-life balance. Uh, so I thought uh, I'd be able to craft a different kind of life uh, in my own firm. And I wasn't on my own. I had two partners who were at a similar stage of life with young children and all of that juggle. So what was it like running your own practice? Did your work patterns change? Uh, no. Uh, I think what I realised in hindsight I created was a mini version of what I left, partly because it was what I knew and partly because I love my job. I really enjoyed doing it, I got an intellectual kick out of it. What was day-to-day -day Anne-Marie like during that time? I, I'd, I'd put her into two categories, one before children and one after children, because before children I could do whatever it took, could get the job done, could work every day till I didn't know what day it was. What happened when you had children? Uh, I pretended for a while with my first child, that nothing really had changed and I could be all things to all people and available around the clock. And you don't change your professional aspirations just because you become a mother. What happened when you had your second child? 
I think then, uh, for me, the game was up. The idea that I could continue to be all things to all people really changed, that I really had to make a, a different kind of transition to work and home. And that was really, really, really difficult. What were you like during that time? I would describe myself uh, at, in a professional sense as pretty unchanged, but work got the best of me and my family got what was left. And I think this is true of all working mums, not just lawyers. Reasonably um, short on energy uh, and compassion by the time I got home, which is a diabolical position for a mum of young children to be in. And I was pretty brittle. Mm. Alan, you're 56 um, and you've worked as a paramedic for 22 years. What sort of hours do you work? I feel a bit guilty. Um, I, we work long shifts, but a 38 hour week plus extras if needed. What times of day do you work? So you start the 22 years I've been doing uh, two 12 hour days from seven till seven. And um, then the night shifts are seven till seven overnight. Can you give me an example of the seriousness of some of the things you have to deal with? Oh, it varies from someone being run over by a car to someone dying in front of you. Mm. And how often do those sort of things happen? How often are they a part um, of your major job? Major trauma's not a very big part of the job anymore. You know, once a week, once a fortnight, you'd have to deal with someone passing away. Mm. And what other kinds of things do you get called out to? Um, <laughs> people just don't believe me when I say it. The three I picked out this week was I can't sleep, I've got a cut toe and I've popped a blister. People called an ambulance. Mm for those things. And all three of those, we missed meal breaks to, to attend those cases. What's that like when that it's happens? It's just relentless. It's the same drone every day and it gets really routine and mundane and um, it's, there's nothing really exciting about it. And then occasionally you'll get the job that is exciting, which I suppose is what keeps us coming back. So where does that leave you as a professional, given you know, that you're trained to deal with a lot of those serious incidents as well. I uh, really uh, just disengaged. Even though there might not be anything in it, there's always this expectation that you're going to have to be empathetic, you're going to have to be sympathetic, you have to always be the caring person that's, you know, they're there, you know, everything's going to be all right. Mm. And how has it affected you personally? I was the class clown, the happy-go-lucky, always playing practical jokes, doing crazy stuff. Um, I, I disengage from work, I disengage from employees, I sort of withdraw at home a bit and I withdraw from friends. I'd never had anxiety before, um, now I have to be really mindful of my anxiety. I think uh, zero to cranky um, was something that was happening much more often. I just get really frustrated and really cranky and something small will just tick me off. And do you feel satisfied in your job at all or not? Um, at times I do, you know, occasionally you get to places where someone actually really needs your help or you can actually make a difference in that person's life. I suppose an example the other day, if it doesn't get me upset, we had a man who had been taken out of hospital to go and celebrate his 66th wedding anniversary. And whilst he was at his own party, he became too unwell to stay there. So we had to go and get him. And there's this mix of wheeling him through a lot of people clapping, cheering, crying, bawling, like 50 people with 50 different emotions and you're in the middle of all of that and it, it's sometimes it's just a little bit, can get a bit overwhelming mm. and I think that the big burnout for me is that after that there's no time to actually then process that because we've become so busy that's when you go to the cut toe and that's when you become really cranky. And 10 years ago do you think you would have had that same reaction? No, definitely not. Mm. Justine, at 32, you run a business that's raised more than $6 million for charitable projects. When did you start feeling burnt out? Yeah, I know in 2013, I was Googling, am I burnt out? <laughs> um, but I was, I was quite busy at that time. I got a little bit extra help and then things started to be fine again. Um, but after I had my son, 
in 2015. Um, I came back into work and things were just very busy. I kept up a very similar pace. Now when you say very busy, what kind of busy? I was going from meeting to meeting, um, so I didn't have time to process what happened from one meeting to the other. Um, I wasn't able to have lunch, or if I did, I was eating on the go. Um, and that would be going right throughout the whole day, get home, put my son to bed, and then go again um, till, you know, um, late hours of the night. And how was your body reacting to what you were putting it under, the stress that you were putting it under? I thought I was doing okay and I always would have been very good at handling stress. Um, but after I came back, after having a baby, I noticed that I wasn't handling stress the way I used to. Um, I was getting reoccurring infections um, quite often. I started getting quite dizzy and nauseous and, and constant migraines as well. Mm. Now, you got medical advice. Mm -hmm. What was it? I had actually tried a few different um, GPs and we're, we're not actually able to get to um, the root of the issue. Um, I'd been on constant um, uh, antibiotics, um, but then when I went to an integrative doctor, they did some tests, checked my cortisol levels, and they were through the roof. And I was told I had adrenal fatigue. How did you react when you were told that? I was actually told I needed to take three months off and that was a shock for me. Um, I was about to run a large campaign that was due to launch in three months time and I was like, no, I can't, I can't do that. I can't take the next three months off. What sort of person do you think you were during that time when you were working hard like that? I, I was quite frustrated towards the end there when it was going so fast. Um, I felt like I was on a treadmill that was going faster than I could even control. Um, I was, because I was getting rushed from meeting to meeting and my schedule was so tight, I couldn't even stop to have a conversation with someone um, within the workplace and that was, that was really hard. I felt like it wasn't who I was and um, it was sort of eating me alive as well. And what did all that lead to? What happened? Yeah, well, it, obviously all the stress and, and that put stress on my body. My body completely shut down. When I did take the time off, um, I thought that I could do hobbies or things like that, but I was actually bedridden for the first three months because my body completely crashed. How long did that crash last for? It was about four months where I was really bedridden, um, but I ended up taking nine months off in total before I really felt like I was me again. We were heading into our next tour and I didn't want to get up for training. I saw the phone ringing, I picked it up, threw it against a wall and thought that's some pretty irrational behaviour. It took me a little bit to actually call the wellbeing manager for the Diamonds and tell her that I wasn't okay. Burnout isn't just a response to working long hours or having a hard job. It's feelings of exhaustion, cynicism and a reduced sense of accomplishment at work. Experts say it's the result of long-term job stress that hasn't been managed. Estimates vary on how widespread burnout is, with figures ranging from 8% to more than 60% of workers in some industries. And emerging research shows ongoing stress may change the very structure of your brain affecting memory, attention and emotional regulation. Limited studies have also looked into the relationship with mental health conditions. The theory is that burnout could make you more vulnerable to depression, but experts aren't yet clear whether it's the cause or the effect. And while burnout isn't considered a medical condition itself, the World Health Organisation recently recognised it as a workplace syndrome and is investigating what might help. Justine, can you describe the symptoms you had, the physical symptoms? For me, the first one was noticing that I was not handling stress the way I used to. When you run a business, you don't sweat the small stuff, but I was noticing I was sweating the small stuff a lot more. Um, I was having migraines, um, I got dizziness. The memory loss was a big one for me. What I thought was baby brain to start with um, actually escalated to the point where I couldn't remember a conversation I had earlier that day. Um, and the reoccurring infections and sickness was the thing that really got me down. And that was what also drew, drew me my attention to know that something is not right. And you'd had chronic fatigue when you were younger. That's right. Do you think that was a factor 
or not? I have been told that that was a big factor in it, that that's really affected um, my immune system and so I, I didn't have a strong base to start with. Daniel, you're Justine's husband. You run the company, thank you, together. What was she like during this time from your perspective? <clears throat> well, this is going to be on the record. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we, we started when we were dating so that we got to know each other through this whole journey and it was really hard to watch this sort of fall from grace. You talk about not sweating the small stuff, but how she would react at times to things. And, and I'm thinking that isn't how she is or, um, you know, the, the Justine I know. But then probably the hardest thing was when she stopped, um, to which we both thought, look, it'll be a couple of weeks, it's all good. But then she stops and for a couple of months in bed, that was the weirdest thing. Someone who's a high achiever, moves fast, gets through so much, is struggling to get out of the room. Yeah. How long had it gone on before you crashed, Justine? I would say it had been around a two-year period of lead-up to it. And can you describe for me just a little bit more what that period was like when you crashed? You know, the kinds of things that you couldn't do and how you felt? I was a mum and so um, I, I had some support looking after my son, which was great, but that also made me feel incredibly guilty. I felt like I was a completely absent mum. Uh, I think that was the biggest thing for me. Um, but then even down to little things like not even being able to read um, because I was just too exhausted. I also got insomnia as well during that time, so then I could not sleep at night. Michael, you're an organisational psychologist and you also study burnout. Is it just being exhausted or is it something else? Exhaustion is a big part of it and feeling exhausted right before the day even begins, that's a big part of burnout. But going along with that is that idea of just disengaging with things, being cynical, just losing that spark that really got you excited about the work to begin with. And then along with that, there's people just lose confidence and that you're doing important work and that you're doing it really well. And that combination of sort of exhaustion and cynicism and discouragement is really the full burnout syndrome. What do you think drives burnout? Like, what is it about fundamentally? Well, fundamentally, I see it, it's uh, really, it's a, like a relationship breakdown between a person and their work context. And like, we look at six areas, workload is a big part of it. Is the workload just getting too much? It's the workload getting too full of things that just aren't really meaningful. A sense of control, whether you can make decisions, a uh, sense of reward. It's that intrinsic reward that you do when you're doing work that you love or getting recognition from other people. Reward's really important. Community, whether you have really fulfilling, supportive relationships with other people doing your work, that's a big part. If that breaks down, it pushes people towards burnout. But fundamentally, it all comes down to a mismatch of my values and the values that are being driven by this work context that I'm existing in. Gordon, you're a psychiatrist and you're heading several studies into burnout in Australia. What sort of things are you looking into and what do you think it is? We undertook a very big survey via the Black Dog Institute website, 900 people, and that gave, I think, a differing definition of burnout. We gave a big tick to exhaustion. The lack of empathy we thought was rather narrow and what the people were more reporting was a lack of feeling any social interaction as having any positivity. Yes, we got decreased work performance, but we also got a fourth factor, a, a cognitive one, and people have alluded to that. People with burnout tend to report that they can't read in any depth. They just scan the newspaper so that their attention is affected. And the final point of differentiation, I think, is that when the burnout measures were developed, they were developed only for examining burnout in the workplace. And we found in our sample, half of the people weren't in a workplace when they developed the work burnout. They were people looking after young children, uh, others who were looking after elderly relatives and caring for them. So I think burnout can exist in other situations apart from a formal workplace, from the workplace. environment. Mm. Yeah. Does personality play a part in this? I've yet to meet somebody who's really laid back and sort of says, no worries, mate, that suffers from burnout. I think that people who experience burnout are much more likely to be reliable, conscientious, perfectionistic, their word is their bond, they want to do the, the 
uh, work as hard as they can, they're loyal to the organisation, and they work hard and long. And uh, some t to some degree, they may define themselves by their work. And then if they're told, OK, well, look, um, you need to take three months off work, that can be quite shattering to them. Anne-Marie, ten years into running your firm, you got Ross River fever. Mm. What happened then? The GP who confirmed uh, the Ross River diagnosis said the best thing to do was to take a month off work and he gave me a medical certificate and I put that in my back pocket and I went to work every day. Why did you do that? I did it because uh, that is what I felt was expected of me as a partner in a law firm upon whose... Uh, that my staff's living was dependent on me and me being there. This is your own firm? Yes. Mm. Our clients were dependent on the service that we delivered and uh, doing that and being all of that was still really important to me. The narrative of my whole life has been I could have it all if I just worked hard enough. And it took a long time for me to realise that that's grossly naive. And if I, unless I thought about the way I was doing my job, then the end uh, was going to come around a lot more quickly than I would have liked. What sort of person were you like during that time when you're going to work every day with Ross River fever and I, coming I, home to the kids? I know from speaking to many uh, mums in the profession that, that this is not unusual, but um, I remember one time I was on a call and my son was walking around in the background saying, Mum's on the phone, she's always talking, but never to us. And uh, my daughter's favourite game was uh, to ask me, uh, are you going to be home today? And I would say yes. And she would say, fantastic. And this is when she was a preschooler. And she would run off to her room and get a doll and a bag and come back to me and thrust the doll into my arms and say, great, I've got a meeting and then I'm going to have to go to the shops. I'm not sure when I'll be back. The baby hasn't been fed yet, but um, I'll be as quick as I can. Bye. Um, she's got a fantastic imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Very sobering moments for a mum. But during that time I saw an interview with a child uh, psychiatrist and one of the descriptions that one of the patients had given this psychiatrist was to say that my mum is everywhere and nowhere all at once. And I thought, I don't want to become that parent and I'm at great risk of becoming that parent unless I think about what it is I'm doing here. Shani, uh, two years ago you were the captain of the Australian netball team, the Diamonds, and you were awarded International Player of the Year. How were you feeling at that time? Um, I was feeling pretty crappy, um, funnily enough. Um, funny being an ironic word. In what way? I always wanted to be the best netballer in the world. Um, and in 2017 I got both of those things and I felt physically sick from achieving them. Um, I didn't want them. I didn't want the pressure that came with it. Um, and a lot of what we've already heard here tonight around being really distant, not knowing who you are, um, not being in touch with yourself, not having feelings or emotions, really resonate with me because when I achieved these things, I was empty and that was a really sad place to be. Now, your netball career had started to take off when you were a teenager. Um, how did you approach things like training and setting goals for yourself then? Yeah, so my dad sat me down at about 14 and said, you know, Shani, you need to set your goals if you need to achieve something. And so for me, um, I always, you know, set my goals from a really young age. So my goal setting never stopped. It was definitely the perfectionism and the overachiever of wanting to have everything, but very happy to work for it at the same time. Now, you were playing professionally in the top league by 2010. Um, four years later, you were a full-time athlete. What was that like? It was amazing. It was actually phenomenal. So, in 2014, I got the opportunity to move to Sydney with the New South Wales Swifts, and they were offering me a full-time contract, which is around $60,000, $70,000, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you serious? Like, an athlete's even earned this much? This is amazing. I'm like an AFL footballer. Check me out. I'm just going to, you know, play sport as a job. And that was my dream come true. I thought my dreams had come true. Describe your training schedule at its peak. What was it like? So, when you're with your domestic side, you're training five to six times a week for six months of the year. And then the girls swap straight over into international. And they'll then train from that seven to 11 times a week 
um, for the other six months of the year. During that 12 month period, they might get two weeks off, um, but you're still expected to train during those two weeks. How did that play out for you early on? So kind of 2014 days, you just get through it. I think you're a bit younger, you've got more energy, um, it's more exciting, it's more new. With the Australia team, you're travelling, and so that's really exciting to start off with. Um, yeah, but as you go on and the grind continues, um, me and the welfare manager of the Australian Diamonds used to have a bit of a joke because at the end of every Australian tour every year, I would break down. Um, and I'll what be, does that mean? Um, How so, would you sorry, break so I'd break down. So the last tour would end, I would get home and I would be bedridden for anywhere for three to five days, um, exhausted, crying, not processing anything. I would call her and be like, it's happened again. She's like, OK, let's work on this for next year and keep trying to work towards it. And I think the thing is, it's not just what comes with being an athlete, but it's who you have to be when you're wearing the colours um, of your team or your country, all the media appearances that you have to do, all the sponsorship endorsements that come with getting paid, which is really exciting. Shani Layton became a netballer and I lost to Shani really was to my family and everyone else because of that. How did you start feeling about netball then? as time wore on and what was happening to you? I started to resent it. I really didn't enjoy it. Trainings became really hard. Um, but I filled that gap with achievement. And the more I strived to achieve and achieve, the bigger my resentment got and the more I started to dislike the game. What was happening to you during that time? So during that time, um, it just it completely wore me down. Um, I didn't realise that I was burnt out. Um, similar to Justine, probably for a, anywhere for two and a half to maybe three years that it really started to grind. And I ended up with depression because of it. Um, I used to rock up to training in tears, wipe them away, hold a strong face, walk in, train, walk out, break down again. Um, and it all kind of came to a head in the middle of 2017. So this was after I'd already become the Australian captain and we were heading into our next tour um, and I didn't want to get up for training. One of my best friends tried to call me. I saw the phone ringing. I picked it up, threw it against a wall and thought that's some pretty irrational behaviour. Um, I'm uh, self-aware enough to know that that's not normal. Um, and it took me a little bit to gain the courage to get up, pick up my phone and actually call the wellbeing manager for the Diamonds and tell her that I wasn't OK. And what happened after that? She put me onto a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And through, uh, from my very first meeting with the psychiatrist, I knew that I was very unwell. He said, so I think you've got depression. I said, yeah, like I'm pretty bad. He said, yes, you are. Um, let's get you better. So you took months off. Yeah. And then you went back. Yes. And then what happened after that? So... Um, my motto in life has always been never leave any stone unturned and so I thought I can't quit this sport um, that I have loved so much but that first training session back, you've got it so we've got like sidelines in netball, right? You run across the court and I remember setting up like sideline and we had to run from sideline to sideline and back again and I thought if I have to run to this effing sideline one more time in my life, I'm going to punch myself in the face. Like it was like I was so angry. And it was my first training session back and I had to get through a whole other nine months of playing netball when I knew that I was done. And you hear athletes say, or maybe in any profession, when you're done, you're done. You're done. And I was like, oh, I am done. So you retired. So I retired. What sort of person were you, Shani, in the middle of your burnout? I was horrible. I was just... Um, like, I couldn't even smile like this because this is a genuine smile. If I was smiling at you, it would have been like gritted teeth, a bit of muscle work up here. What were you like with your teammates? Absent. It's really difficult to have a mental illness and play elite sport because they need all of you. They need the best of you all the time. So if you can't rock up and be 100% there, um, then that's not good enough in a team environment. So that was a really hard environment to be a part of when you're mentally struggling. Michael, um, Shani mentioned depression. What is the connection, in your view, between burnout and depression? Depression's much more broad-based. It clouds every, sort of every dimension of life, whereas burnout, when we're looking at burnout, we're looking at something that's tied to a particular situation, whereas depression is much more of a whole pervasive experience for people. But, you know, it can set the groundwork that can trigger a burnout, a, a depression kind of episode and, and, and certainly aggravate it because there's enough overlap between the two conditions. 
Gordon, one of the things you're looking into is the relationship between burnout and mental health conditions. Burnout isn't described as a mental health condition. Um, what are you finding, though, about the connections, if any connections exist? Well, that study is underway and it's uh, an issue that has been discussed for nearly 2,000 years. Is burnout depression or are the two independent or are the two interdependent? I personally don't see the two as synonymous. I think they are differing conditions. How do you work out chicken and egg with this, with burnout and mental health conditions? I think the normalcy of it is the key point in arguing that it's not a mental illness, in the same way with grief. So grief is a similar story to burnout in the sense that uh, grief is sometimes equated with depression, as is burnout, but there are great points of difference. Grief is normal and only about 20% of people who grieve actually ever go on to develop depression. Burnout, I think, is also normative and there's a very big boundary between burnout as a sort of normal, understandable syndrome as against being a psychiatric condition. And I hope that barrier stays because if it gets compromised, there is a real risk of people being you know, given inappropriate medication and a whole series of other interventions that would pathologise it above and beyond what it is deserves. Shani, after all your sporting achievements, how did you feel about retiring when you did it? I felt so relieved. I was so happy. It was probably the happiest that I'd been in a while. Um, but it was a funny reaction because obviously not a lot of people saw it coming from the outside, except for my immediate family who did. Um, and so it was almost like in the netball world, this huge thing that I was retiring, but I just knew that it, it was right. And yeah, it definitely was. I thought this is what professional suicide feels like. <laughs> <laughs> How did they react? people were applauding and crying and the response was absolutely uh, incredible. You were diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder two years ago. It's become so entrenched that there is pretty much nothing that I do the normal way. It was taking me three hours ish to get to bed every night. I had become obsessed with work. Anne-Marie, you were awarded Woman Lawyer of the Year in Queensland last year. Can you read for us um, some of your acceptance speech? Ladies and gentlemen, I have a confession to make. I am tired. I'm tired because I'm 44 years old, self-employed and the mother of two primary school age children. Tired goes with the territory. I'm tired because I'm a lawyer and the law is a jealous mistress. But most of all, I'm tired from 20 years of doing a job through a prism that is inconsistent with who I am, a lens that I find fundamentally one-dimensional and inherently aggressive. It's inherently adversarial. The way the law is largely practised invites lawyers to solve problems by first making them bigger mm -hmm. and then by aggressively holding a position until a decision is imposed or a compromise based on brinkmanship is reached. I don't naturally think like that but I've been taught that that's how my job is done and I've learned how to excel at it. But I am tired. I am exhausted from walking that walk. It affects who I am. It dims my light. The time to think about and then work out how to practise as a problem solver, not a gladiator, is upon us. What was it like saying that in front of all your peers, being awarded Woman Lawyer of the Year? absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I, I thought this is what professional suicide feels like. <laughs> <laughs> How did they react? It was one of the eeriest rooms I've ever spoken to and as I uh, finished there was some polite modest applause but when I got down off the stage I realised the room was on their feet and people were applauding and crying and the response was absolutely uh, incredible and I realised I'd really started a conversation about something that was not related just to me, but really pervaded the law in, an, in enormous ways. What did you do from there about your own situation? 
So I made the very, very difficult decision that I needed to leave my practice in order to work as a lawyer in a way that was much more authentic uh, and sustainable for me. And that didn't take every ounce of my being to practice in a particular way that was exhausting for me. And so now I work only in dispute resolution uh, as a mediator and um, training lawyers from all sorts of different practice areas around the country in all of the skills that you can apply day to day to be that kind of problem solver rather than making problems bigger and dealing with them aggressively from the outset. What was it like for you stepping away from that firm that you had established? Uh, it, it was so difficult. It, it took me years to get to that point. My sense of self and purpose was very tied up with that and I, I loved that work on the one level I got a, a great uh, sense of enjoyment and satisfaction from it but the um, cost to me as a human being was just too great and I wasn't prepared to get to the point um, of burnout or worse and the law has terrible statistics about depression and anxiety and I was determined not to be one of those. Cheryl and Stephen, what have you both decided to do? Being a perfectionist, I'm so happy other people think the same way I do. I mean, I, I really genuinely thought I was uh, alone. Um, Cheryl and I have decided we've got to remove ourselves from um, you know, the day-to-day -day grind and we've put the farm on the market. I think it's the only way I, I can um, genuinely get away from, and, and Cheryl, um, from the situation that we're in. What's that like, making that decision? Oh, it's like someone took a truck off your shoulders. It's um, a relief. Oh, hell yeah. It wasn't yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it... It, it was, but it wasn't. Yeah. I think the thing I struggle with is that when I first started, the farm was a very small part of who I was. Now the farm is who I am. Yeah. And I would just like for us to be able to be us. I may decide I don't like him after the farm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> How long have you been married? <laughs> we've, we've, since we met, like, the farm. The farm has been our life. Um, our relationship has been the farm, working mm. the farm, making sure the farm's OK, the girls are OK. The, mm. it, it's never the cows. Just, yeah. Yes, the cows. The cows, the cows. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, it's never just been us, no. you know? So no. it, it's actually quite a daunting thought that one day we will wake up and it and it will be a okay what are we gonna do for day shit you know shit, it's Saturday like <laughs> let's go for a drive and just see where we end yeah, up yeah. rather than mm, right. it's time to go we've got to get home. Stephen I'm interested in you saying how you know reassuring it was to hear these other stories can you just explain a little bit more about why you feel that way? Uh, well Again, everyone said it in their own little language, but you sort of, you know, think, am I all right? Yeah, I don't know, it's just it's self-doubt. It's, it's a lot of things, but, um, yeah, just hearing all those words, I'm thinking, you please, they're not going to lock me up. <laughs> what, you felt that hearing other people's oh, stories? Oh, yeah, hell yeah. And it's the same as talking about depression. The more you hear it, uh, the more people talk about it, the easier it is to deal with. There is a stigma attached to, to depression, and I don't think there is with, with burnout, but, but they're so similar at the same time. Um, but definitely hearing, hearing these words, yeah, it's been yeah, very refreshing for me. So, Alan, what would have helped you, do you think, or could have helped you? When I first started 20, 22 years ago, you would go and do <clears throat> a significant job and you would come back to the station and you would talk over the bonnet, you'd clean the car, you'd have a cup of tea, and you'd do that for an hour or so. N now it's, you're being chased every five minutes. So there's no time to process. Um, so, yeah, if, if that changed, I mean, it, it might make things a bit easier. Mm. But I can't, I can't see that happening. Shani, do you have a sense of what might have helped you during the time you were experiencing burnout? Um, I think for athletes in general, um, perhaps if we had have had more time off just to be ourselves, just not training all day, every day, um, if there was more of a life balance in being an athlete, um, that I could be a human outside of that then it definitely would have increased my longevity um, but it's really funny because there's all this hype around we, you know we care about your mental health and 
we want you to do things outside, but actually by the time you finish training and by the time you've been at the club all day or whatever it is, you don't actually have the energy to speak to people or go and see family or you might be interstate and therefore you're at home alone anyway. So it just needs to be more accepted to be able to have a life out of your sport whilst you're still playing sport. It doesn't mean that you're not invested and that you don't care, whereas at the moment that's definitely how it's perceived. Michael, many of the people here have taken time off or they've left their jobs. You consult with employers. What is the employer responsibility in all of this? Well, the employer responsibility, I think, first of all, is, is to listen and pay attention to what people are telling them. It's just getting more and more demanding and, and, and more rigidly structured, because I think that's what we're hearing from various people too. It's put together in a way that people need to adapt themselves to get along with this rigid structure of how work is rolling along. And I think work needs to loosen up a little bit more uh, and adapt to the way people are. Nicole, you're 27. Your workplace has been recognised as one of Australia's best places to work. Let's have a little look at what it's like. When I first walked into Canva, I was pretty shocked. I just remember seeing like a big bowl of avocados and getting so excited. So this is our kitchen. What's for lunch today, Kat? <laughs> I have learnt in my previous experience with working that um, the best way for me to do well for a company but also to do well for myself is to put up really clear professional and personal boundaries. I think it's really comforting to know that you're not going to be reprimanded or in trouble if you show up a little bit later because you've had a, a bad sleep. If you're getting your job done, it's actually fine to sort of take the time you need. It sounds really cliche, but coming to work with friends and having breakfast and lunch together and then working really hard in the day and then kind of relaxing and hanging out at night. It's a lot more, I don't know, exciting to come into work. You don't really get the Monday blues. Nicole, you work in marketing yeah. there, um, but at the start of last year, you felt very differently about work to the way you feel now. How? Um, I started my career as a journalist, um, fresh out of uni, uh, and kind of went through that trajectory of, you know, being an editorial assistant and writing articles and moved into digital publishing in fashion and beauty and lifestyle. And I think just the, the demands and the hours um, and the fast-paced nature of it started to really wear me out. How? I was just getting completely exhausted. I felt like I didn't have the same amount of energy as, say, the rest of my colleagues. I didn't sort of function well under that adrenaline rush. And we were sort of churning out stories and articles and I would just find myself kind of getting into these, like, panics um, and sort of needing to sort of run to the bathroom and take a moment out and essentially have, you know, a panic attack um, and then compose myself and come back out to finish my, you know, rolling deadlines. So. How long did that go on for, that fe those feelings? Um, I had? would say probably about a year and a half. How were you feeling about the work you were doing at the time? In uni, you're told it's so hard to get a job in fashion, it's so hard to get a job in journalism, and so I went into it with, you know, so excited, and I think by the end of my career in that, I just realised it wasn't for me, um, and I needed to make quite a stark pivot away from that industry because it was not something that was sustainable or that I could do any longer and it was only going to get worse um, as time progressed. Now, during that time you developed Crohn's disease. Yes. How did the workplace react to that? Yeah, so I think um, being a young woman and getting diagnosed with any kind of chronic illness is quite shocking um, and you don't really know what pieces you need to put in place um, to sort of help alleviate you know, your physical symptoms. I've always had really great uh, managers and mentors in my time, you know, in publishing, but however, the culture and the requirements of the workplace meant that I had to be there at a certain time. So there was only so much that they could do to facilitate my needs. What sort of practical things yes. are different about the way you work now? You know, the onus is on the individual, but it's also on bosses and managers and workplaces to really start thinking about how to curb burnout. Um, so some practical things is I we have flexible working. So you just say I'm working from home. Um, I leave at five every day um, and I turn my instant messages off and I turn my emails off because I 
need extra sleep and I need to be home because I sort of tend to get quite tired. Um, and yeah, I have, I'm called the boundary girl because they know that I'm really a big fan of them. Um, and it, it'll keep me in the company longer. It'll keep me performing. Um, yeah. Amory, what are your work patterns like now? Uh, they are really intense when I'm on, but I have much more time available for my growing family in the way that they actually need and respond to. And I think that's helped my work practice, not um, diminish that in any way. Justine, you've gone back to running your company with Daniel. How are you managing now? I think having the time off for me was so transformational. I needed to to learn these new patterns and the patterns are setting boundaries, walking at a, uh, a much more sensible pace, making sure I'm breathing throughout the day, um, but also making sure I've got the, the space for the things that really matter the most. Shani, how did you turn the corner? Um, for me, um, yeah, it was just a new, a new lifestyle. It's um, very daunting as a 30, 30 31 year old exiting um, <laughs> sport and then not really knowing what you're going to do with your life, but it was just really exciting at the same time. What do you do now? So now um, I play AFLW, which is really fun, um, but I don't see that as playing sport, funnily enough, <laughs> because for me, netball was full time and I had to be the best, but in football, I suck. Um, you know, I'm getting better, I'm learning new skills, but I'm just surrounded by this great encouragement environment. Can't even hit the ball, as you can see. Um, <laughs> but I'm in this environment where girls are helping me learn this brand new skill and I'm literally just playing it for the love of it. Like these girls don't get paid, they get paid very minor, but like it just brings back the passion and the love of why you actually do something. And all of our trainings after hours so we can work full time. So I'm currently, you know, studying full time and doing my personal training course because I love being in a gym and helping people. And that's something that gives me great satisfaction. And since I retired from netball, you know, I met my fiance. So um, it just gives you time to have those things in your life that you really enjoy. And as I said, hanging out with family and stuff. But yeah, for me, it's all around what makes me feel good rather than actual achievements as such and the sport's just a bonus on the side. Mm. Cheryl, what do you think is next for you? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> as long as it doesn't involve staring down the business end of a cow. <laughs> I really don't care. <laughs> Although with Canberra sort of being all over the place, uh, I think I might give uh, old Morrison a, a run for his job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might go into politics. Well, you never know. I'm, I'm open to any calls or, you know, like, yeah, I'll put my hand up. <laughs> all right, we, we will watch that with interest. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's been great to talk to you, and that is all we have time for here. But let's keep talking online, and you can also watch uh, plenty of episodes uh, of Insight uh, on SBS On Demand. Our archive is on SBS On Demand. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, good night.